Well now, it's been several years of doing this YouTube thing, and I've never done a Kirby video. Well, let's fix that today. If you've been following stuff we play for a while, it's no secret that I'm a huge fan of the Game Boy. But one thing you might not know is that I also love the Kirby series. Seriously, Forgotten Land is probably going to be my game of the year for 2022. I just love it. Oh, and Kirby's Adventure is probably my favorite non-Mega Man game for the NES. However, Kirby got his start back on this gray brick right here. The original Game Boy. Back in 1992, a steamed Smash Brothers creator and famous YouTuber Masahiro Sakurai spearheaded development on Kirby's Dream Land, which, again, came out on the original Game Boy, in the process kicking off this entire long-running series. So today I figured, let's take a look at all of Kirby's adventures both for the original Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. Yeah, all five, wait six, well technically seven of them, you you'll see what I mean. And that's Kirby's Adventures. Plural, not to be confused with Kirby's Adventure, singular, for the NES. You should totally play that one if you haven't, though. The intro even teaches you how to draw Kirby. From art lessons to love crafty and horrors beyond our human comprehension, this series really does have a little something for everyone. The very first game in the series was 1992's Kirby's Dream Land. And you know this one's old because Kirby is depicted as gray and white in the box. No pink here, y'all. The plot here is the most standard of standard Kirby fare. King DDD is an asshole and has stolen a bunch of food. Kirby is hungry and angry, so he's gotta go through five whole levels, sucking and blowing his way across the land to lay the smack down on the king. And yeah, just five stages, and Kirby doesn't even have his iconic copy ability. That wouldn't be introduced until the next game, which, funnily enough, is Kirby's Adventure in the Nest. Just play the damn game. Suck in enemies, blow them out, and maybe, if you're lucky, use a screen nuking microphone if you get one, get some temporary invincibility, or even make the game turn into a shmup. Kirby was initially aimed to be an accessible game that even little kids could jump into. So long with being able to run and jump, Kirby can fly infinitely, making most actual platforming in this platform range from easy to laughable. To boot, extra lives are plentiful, and stages, while not super short, aren't that long either. The whole game can be beaten in just around 20 minutes, and without the copy ability, it's a rather basic affair. That's not to say there isn't any charm here. Even in black and white, every single level looks bright and has a really nice cartoonish aesthetic. There's even transition cutscenes, most of which involve Kirby getting hurt somehow. And yeah, I chuckled at most of these. In order, the stages here are Green Greens, Castle Lolo, Float Islands, Bubbly Clouds, and Mount DDD. Every stage has secret rooms to find, a mid-boss, and an end-stage boss, save for Mount DDD, which is a boss rush that culminates with a fight against the king himself. The final battle against DDD himself, actually, isn't too bad, though it certainly overstays its welcome at times. Sometimes I'd find myself constantly going back and forth, just waiting for him to swing or do this ass pounce so I could suck up a star and shoot it back at him. Damn, huh, didn't expect to say that sentence today. Yeah, K Kirby sucks and blows a lot. It's a thing, okay? Really, none of the game gave me much trouble, though. The only time I die my last run through, it was because I wasn't paying enough attention against this spiky dude here. But even then, only a few minutes later, DDD was defeated and Kirby turned into a balloon. If you Google Kirby inflation, I wonder if this is the first thing that comes up. But yeah, Kirby's first adventure is pretty fun. It's basic even for an early Kirby game and pretty standard for Game Boy platforms of the era, but it still is a really fun little game, even if the original Game Boy version isn't the definitive way to play this one. Okay, I'm cheating a bit with this one, but you know I love mentioning DX ROM hacks whenever I can. I previously talked about Super Mario Land DX and a video did in the original Game Boy's launch titles, and well, such a fan-made upgrade exists for Kirby's Dream Land 1 and 2. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to focus on the DX hack of Dream Land 1 and kind of lump both of these together into one segment. For those out of the loop, a DX hack is a hack of an original Game Boy game that gives it a full Game Boy Color color palette. Some say add a little more or do some bug fixes, but not always. The term DX is used for these because it's rather similar to what was done in the officially released The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX for the Game Boy Color, which was just a full color GBC port of Zelda Link's Awakening, which should come out on the OG Game Boy a few years prior. In the Kirby's Dream Land DX hack, it doesn't add in Kirby's copy ability from the later games or anything. It strictly just adds a new color palette, which perhaps would be an issue if it didn't make the game
game pop wonderfully. Seriously, if you want to play this game on real hardware, patch your copy with this DX hack. It's almost surreal seeing Kirby in his natural pink in this original outing. I say almost because I do think the best way to play through the original Kirby's Dream Land is actually via Spring Breeze here. This is one of the many adventures included in both Kirby Superstar for the SNES and Kirby Superstar Ultra on the DS. Now it is missing the shoot-up stage which is a shame, as it makes this short adventure even shorter, now being beatable in around 15 minutes. But Kirby does actually have his copy ability now. Yay! You can also play it co-op with a friend, and of course, the whole adventure is in beautiful 16-bit full color. While the original version of Dreamland is serviceable and the DX version is the best way to play it on any of the Game Boy systems, Spring Breeze is by far the best way to play through it, period. I'm not sure if I've talked about this before, but I've always had a soft spot for Game Boy pinball games. I mean, I've sunk countless hours into both Pokemon Pinball and Revenge of the Gator, which perhaps makes it surprising that before recording this video, I never actually played Kirby's Pinball Land. I mean, it combines two things I like, Pinball and Kirby, but honestly, I'd never even heard someone talk about this one online before. Anyways, here it is. One day, King DDD falls on top of Kirby, knocking him out. And then, just to make this pink puffball suffer, he forced him to be a pinball in one of three pinball stages. And uh, yeah, that's the plot here. The tables here are all based around a boss or mid-boss from Dreamland 1. There's Wispy Woods, Poppy Bros Sr., and even Cracko. Oh, yeah, that's the spiky dude's name. The tables all take up multiple screams and have multiple gimmicks. Like in any decent pinball game, it's nice racking up high scores, smashing bumpers, and even taking out enemies. The flipper controls are good and Kirby has some pretty decent ball physics, making this one an overall pretty enjoyable pinball game. There are even some secret codes you can put on the menu to skip straight to boss fights or bonus rounds. I mean, is Kirby's Pinball Land gonna win any awards for being the best Kirby game ever or the best pinball game ever? No. Those words, in my opinion, go to Crystal Shards and N64, and Yoko's Island Express on most modern platforms respectively. But for a fun distraction that would be fun in a subway or bus, Kirby's Pinball Land is definitely one I can easily recommend. If we're going strictly chronologically, the next Kirby title on this list would be 1995's Kirby's Dream Land 2. However, I'm saving that one for the end, so instead I want to take a moment to tell you all about Kirby's Block Ball. Released in December 1995 in Japan and power regions, and May 1996 in North America, Block Ball is Kirby's take on the block breaker genre. You know games like Arkanoid, Breakout, and DX Ball? In this title, King DDD steals five of Kirby's super special sparkly stars and hides them in his castle. Apparently now kept in a place called Block World. The game then consists of ten stages, each divided into numerous sections, and each ending with a boss. Basically, use the paddle at the bottom of the screen to bounce Kirby around and clear all these little piece fragments. Things change up a bit in boss fights. You control four paddles, including two vertical ones, and have to dodge both boss attacks and damaging spikes. It's a pretty good time. The game also has both a good and bad ending, and the devs even found a way to add Kirby's copy ability into the mix. Oh, and the OST goes way, way harder than it has any right to. I know I haven't talked about the music in any of the games so far, but for anyone who's played a Kirby game, I think you'll agree when I say that pretty much every Kirby game has a good to great soundtrack. That said, even by Kirby's already very high standards, the soundtrack in Block Ball is insanely good. The boss theme is probably my favorite tracks, and thanks to Siren Sound at the start of it, it's now set as my alarm every morning. Like Pinball Land, I think Block Ball is really great in short bursts, though I'd argue that somehow comes away feeling a bit more Kirby-ish than that one, if that makes sense. Both games are good for sure, and definitely are a great way to kill a few minutes at a time, but if I had to pick one, I'd definitely go with Block Ball. Definitely check it out if you get a chance. Oh look, another spinoff. Yeah, the seven-ish games we're looking at today, only two are mainline. Of the rest, well, I guess one's a ROM hack and the rest are spinoffs. Released in 1997, Star Stacker here is developer HAL Labs' attempt at something like Puyo Puyo or Dr. Mario. And seeing as how, even in the late 90s, the Game Boy was viewed as a Tetris machine by many, this was the natural place to put a Kirby puzzle game. Now, Star Stacker and the Game Boy wouldn't be the first or last Kirby puzzle game. Kirby's Avalanche was released on the SNES back in 95, and Star Stacker itself would actually get a SNES port in 1998. 
though only in Japan. In this game, patterns of blocks fall from the sky, which you can rotate and place. Along the bottom of the screen are blocks containing several of Kirby's animal friends, first introduced in Dreamland 2, along with star blocks, bomb blocks, and hard to break blocks. These will rise as each round goes on. You want to place stars between multiples of Kirby's friends. The more stars you get between them before you clear them, the more points you get. And of course, you can chain clears and such, and really it's pretty standard puzzle game fare overall. It's done with the level of quality you expect from one of HAL's titles though. There's multiple difficulty modes, a challenge mode, an endless mode, and even the option to compete against a friend by using the Game Boy Link cable. And every time you clear a round, you get some really nice artwork of Kirby himself. I love this stuff. It's amazing how expressive art can really be, even on a tiny Game Boy screen. This one is another solid spin-off. If I had to rank everything so far, I'd put Dreamland at the top, then Blockball, Pinball Land, Star Stacker. I mean, I'd also place Dreamland 2 above Dreamland 1 as the best of the bunch, but we haven't gotten to that one yet. For now though, let's talk about the one Kirby game that was actually originally released for the Game Boy Color. Released in 2000, this is Kirby Tilt and Tumble. And just take a look at this cartridge. Even without playing it, you can tell this is going to be a weird one. I mean, just, ah, uh, you see that weird bulge on that pink cartridge there? Now, Tilt and Tumble at first seems like a pretty run-of-the-mill overhead adventure game. Guide Kirby through each of the eight stages without dying, beat some bosses, and maybe distract yourself with some mini-games. However, Tilt and Tumble has a gimmick, and it defines the entire experience. As you probably guessed from the title, this cartridge has a gyroscopic sensor built into it, meaning that you control Kirby by physically tilting around your Game Boy Color. While I usually hate games that do this, from my experiences, it actually works pretty well here. I just ran into a few problems actually trying to record this one for this video. First off, I'm midway through a move, and the copy I was playing around with was on loan from a friend, so I only had limited time to play this one as Daddy Nintendo intended. Second off, my preferred ways to play Game Boy games are either on my Game Boy Lite or on my GBA SP. Being a clear cart GBC game, it can't work on the light, as that's technically just a beefier Game Boy Pocket, which is based on the original Game Boy and can't play color exclusive games. And due to how the sensor and the cartridge is set up, the controls are actually reversed if you try to play it on the Game Boy Advance SP. According to a cursory Google search, the cartridge is intended to be oriented upright, but the cartridge on the SP is at the bottom of the system, meaning we get this inverted controls issue. Even if it did work though, there's the issue of actually getting high quality gameplay. See, for most other games today, I emulated them. Shocking, I know. But how can I show the real Tilt and Tumble experience without being able to Tilt and Tumble a real Game Boy? In theory, I could use the Game Boy Player for the GameCube, but do you seriously want me to try to flip around my whole ass GameCube? So instead I turned to RetroArch and just mapped my controls to a joystick. It's really not the same though, and as a result, yeah, I'm playing kind of terribly here. The game is absolutely fun though, especially when played as was intended. There's a time limit on each stage, especially when emulating it, could pose some challenge, but it's a really unique game. I think it's one of the few games across the libraries of all the Game Boys that's best played on real hardware. I'd probably put WarioWare Twisted, Yoshi Topsy Turvy, and Boktai in that category as well, though those are all GBA titles. This is another one that's especially fun in short bursts. To complete our Kirby tier list, I'd probably place a Just Blow Block Ball for me. However, there is one more Kirby game I want to cover today, and it's easily my favorite of these 8-bit Game Boy games. And a first for the Kirby series, King DDD isn't the true big bad here. Yeah, spoiler alert for this game from the 90s. Instead, we have Dark Matter. Mmm, horrors beyond imagination. Sakurai made your favorite open wide. Dreamland 2 feels less like a continuation off of Dreamland 1, and more so an improved portable sequel to Kirby's Adventure on the NES. To start off, Kirby actually has his copy ability now, thank god. But on top of that, he has three animal friends who join him on his adventure to help out in stages. There's Rick the Hamster, who runs fast and can't slip on ice, Kind the Sunfish, who can swim easily and isn't affected by water currents, and Koo the Owl, who is actually a much stronger flyer than Kirby is. Of the three, Rick is easily my fave, especially if you have a fiery ability nailed. Instead of just five stages like in the original, there are now seven whole worlds, each with multiple levels. This game also has more of a difficulty curve, making it both longer and more challenging than the first. I mean, it's definitely not super hard. This ain't no Mega Man. 
but I appreciate this nonetheless. The graphics and music are a little richer. Kirby himself controls a little bit more snappier. The abilities, though fewer in total than the NES game, add a whole bunch of variety to each playthrough, and hell, there are even mini-games here as well. Probably my biggest gripe comes in the form of these collectible rainbow drops. The game doesn't tell you this, but there are two different endings, and if you don't get every single one of these rainbow drops, you're getting the bad one. And look, I appreciate replayability in my video games, but this is a little ridiculous. I know this wasn't the last Kirby game to have this issue either, and I, if I remember right, it was even worse in Dreamland 3 on the SNES, but I still think it's a valid criticism. It's a shame, as for the rest of the adventure, everything is pretty great. Overall, really, Dreamland 2 is a game I highly, highly recommend playing any way you can. Just, unless you have a ton of time to kill, maybe just stick with getting the bad ending. You'll absolutely still get your money's worth regardless. To end off, I just wanted to go over how you can actually play these games today. Along with <clears throat> Sound Seven Seasons Search of Booty, you can of course track down the original cartridges. From the cursory eBay search I did, most of them actually seem to be pretty cheap, with the exception of Tilt and Tumble. Likely because it's never seen a re-release, ever. Probably because of those fancy gyro controls. The only way to officially play Tilt and Tumble is still with an official Game Boy Color cartridge, and those can run upwards of $50 USD for a North American version. However, do keep in mind that every Game Boy is thankfully region free. Being a Kirby game, there's minimal dialogue here. So if you really want to give this one a try, I'd recommend you look into importing a Japanese copy, as those often run for $15 or less. For the rest, They've all been made available via the 3DS eShop, so get them while you still can. I'm hoping we get some sort of compilation of all the Kirby spinoffs someday on the Switch or something, as the 3DS eShop is going away next year, and while I do think the Game Boy spinoff titles are best enjoyed in short bursts, they're still worth checking out. Again, fingers crossed we get something on the Switch. Now there was actually a really good Kirby compilation back on the Wii, but that just featured playable versions of the mainline titles. This was Kirby's Dream Collection. Officially speaking, it's probably the best way to play Kirby's Dream Land 1 and 2. It also features Kirby's Adventure for NES, Kirby Superstar and Kirby's Dream Land 3 for SNES, and Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards for the, you guessed it, N64. There's also a 2.5D challenge mode and a small history book. It's a really great package. And of course, I hope you had a great time watching today's video. I'm making some really big changes to the channel soon, including Patreon-wise currently, but just one more time, for the last time potentially, I'd like to go ahead and say thank you to my Patreon patrons, YouTube channel members, and even my Twitch subs. If you want to support me in any way right now, above all else, just subscribing and sharing this video is more than enough for me. But if you do want to throw me a couple bucks, hey, how about it? Before I ramble on more though, I have been Jamie, this has been Stuff We Play, and thank you for joining me for this look at Kirby's Weird Game Boy Games. On that note, thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time.